Hey teams, I'm Coach John Burnett, and in today's episode, our top student pneumatics expert, Elise, will walk you through plumbing your robot. This will include all of the necessary components for running pneumatics, as well as tips and tricks along the way. And before we begin, be sure to like and subscribe so you don't miss another episode. And then leave a comment below with your team name and number so we know who's tuning in. Rookies, keep in mind that pneumatics are not a required component of a robot, but you may find them a useful method to accomplish your desired robot actions. So let's send it over to Elise and get plumbing as we show you This is Howie Robot. Hi everyone, I'm Elise Siegel and I am here to walk you through some basics of pneumatics in FRC. Pneumatics are a great way for linear motion or limited rotational movement without the use of motors and therefore more lightweight. However, there is a big upfront cost in terms of weight and complexity. When we are done setting up all the parts, the system can be four or five pounds worth of material before we get to the light stuff, which is the moving actuators. So if you're going to use pneumatics, use them throughout your robot instead of for just one task. Some of examples of what pneumatic systems can be used for are extending your robot beyond the starting limitations, such as intake systems as seen on this robot. Here we see team 118, the Robonauts out of League City, Texas, using a pneumatic actuator to drive a rack gear to then turn the axle, driving the intake from retracted to an extended position. This is a clever and great use of pneumatics on an FRC robot. Pneumatics can also be found in drive trains where teams are able to shift between high speed gearing and then low speed with more pushing power. An example gearbox with this capability is seen on the screen here with the three sim ball shifter sold by Vex Robotics. The only downside to this style of drivetrain is that the pneumatics must have a pressure for the pancake cylinder to power either direction. Without the pressure, the gears may slide into neutral and the robot will not be able to drive. One big note about using pneumatics is if the actuator is damaged or bent, there's no repairing the mechanism. So be smart about using pneumatics in places where interactions with the field or other robots are likely. We find it disheartening when a robot is not performing at its best because of a bent shaft or a pneumatic actuator and no replacement is available. This means that if you're going to run the risk of putting pneumatics where they might get bent, be sure to have backup copies of that actuator ready to go in between the matches. You are going to need some specific parts to build a pneumatic system that can be found at Andy Mark or the kit of parts which is linked in the description below. First we have the pneumatic control module. This is used to control the compressor, solenoids, and pressure switch. Next there's the compressor. This takes in air and compresses it into a smaller volume increasing the pressure. Then you have the pressure release valve. This is the manual pressure dump for the whole system and it is a safety requirement. Next, we have the pressure switch. This communicates with the Robo Rio about the current pressure and when the pressure goes above 125 PSI, the power shuts off. And then you have the air tanks. This is where the high pressure air is stored. Next, there is the regulator. This is where we turn high pressure into low pressure air. And then there is the gauges. You need one for high pressure and one for low pressure. And then next you have the solenoids. This is the electronic control to fire the actuators when you want to. Single solenoids force one way while double solenoids force either direction. If using singles, we recommend the spring powered return. Otherwise you won't get the actuator to retract on command. Then you have push connectors. Just like plumbing at home, these allow you to split the, up the air into multiple paths and are very useful. And then you have the tubing. This will connect the system together. Note that there are no limitations on color. Usually teams use quarter inch tubing, but some prefer 5 30 seconds as it is easier to bend, but the airflow is limited. Then you have the actuator. These are attached to the parts that you want to move on your robot when the air flows through it. It will push the part out or pull it in. Before working on any pneumatic parts, be sure to release any and all compressed air. 
Also, never fill the air tanks from Clipboard beyond the 125 PSI limit, and never use any air tanks that have been scratched, scored, dented, or damaged in any way. Doing so risks rupturing under normal pressure and sharpnel can go flying. And before we begin assembling, there are a few things we need to cover. Do you need a compressor on the robot? No, but you must use legal compressors only to charge up the tanks. You cannot use hardware store compressors in the pits. How do you know which size actuator to use? This will require some math and knowing how much force is needed to perform the action. Force is equal to the pressure times the cross-sectional area of the actuator. You are allowed to use up to 60 psi air. So if you only need two pounds of force, then something like a quarter inch diameter bore will do the trick. Area equal pi times r squared. So at 60 psi, a quarter inch diameter gives us 0.049 inch squared and therefore 2.94 pounds of force. But a half inch diameter bore actuator gives us 0.2 inch squared and therefore 11.8 pounds of force. How do you know how many tanks to use? Figure out how often you will fire the actuators each match. Then use the volume of air inside each cylinder to figure out how much compressed air will be used when firing. Note that for firing double solenoids, you will have to calculate double the air used, once forward, once back. Then take your volume, multiply it by the firings, and that is your air needed. Each standard clippered cylinder holds 574 milliliters of compressed air. So if your total is 400 milliliters, then you may only need one cylinder. Note that as you use the 120 PSI air in the tank, the pressure decreases. Once you've reached 60 PSI, then you will not get the full force you were asking for after that. Now, let's talk about cutting the tubes. You will be very tempted to grab a pair of scissors and cut right into them. Sure enough, this will cut through the tubing, but in the end, it will end up with a diagonal end as seen here. This will lead to improper seals with the push fittings and ultimately leaks in the system. Instead, you want to use this cutting tool often provided in the kit of parts commonly referred to as a finger guillotine. This will cut from the middle outward, resulting in a square or more even cut across the tube. This makes a better seal with the push fittings and a much smaller chance of a leak. Let's talk about the general setup of the pneumatic system. First made available a guide to help teams, and we are linking that in the description below. But let's walk through this anyway for a good measure. The first step is all about safety. Here is the only place on the entire system where metal parts are required. Straight off the compressor, we need a union T, which feeds out to a push fitting, but also up to a pressure release valve as a safety feature. This valve is designed to relieve pressure in case the digital pressure switch fails to cut off the compressor. This will require some fine tuning once the system is up and running, but be sure this will allow air out of the system after 125 PSI. Pro Q-tip, use plumber's tape on any metal to metal connection. Always wrap against the turn so when you screw the parts together, the tape will stay in place. Now, let's get to those tanks. Cut a length of tubing and run from the push fit we just connected at the union T to your high pressure cylinder or air tank. Go ahead and plumb together as many as you need. At the end of the air tank, we are going to go two ways, so we need a push T. The first direction is where we connect a T, and this is where we are going to find the digital pressure switch. A gauge to read the high pressure, and the manual valve for dumping air as needed. In the other direction, as we head into the regulator to bring the pressure down from 120 PSI to 60 PSI. This means we need to connect to another gauge on the other side of the regulator. When properly tuned, this gauge should never read more than 60 PSI, while the gauge attached to the digital pressure switch should read 120 PSI. Now we are ready for the solenoids. Here we are using a double solenoid as an example. The 60 PSI air from the regulator is now going into the bottom of the solenoid as the input and then the two push fittings on the opposite side lead to an actuator. With these solenoids the push fittings will screw into place but be careful about overturning them as the threaded pieces are small and will break even under the strength of a student tightening them. The push fittings can be tightened by placing an allen wrench or hex key inside the outlet but use a light touch here. Now, the actuator has an out and a return for the pressure flow. 
You can test your system manually using a small screwdriver to activate the little blue buttons on the solenoid. For the PCM, the pressure switch should be wired into the ports labeled pressure switch, while the compressor's red and black wire should go directly into the red and black compressor out ports. The PCM can control eight single solenoid valves or four double solenoid valves. The solenoids can be plugged in on the PCM to the VSOL slots. And finally, the PCM receives power from the PDP through two VIN connectors and signal from the four CAN connectors. Now, let's talk about some common issues with plumbing pneumatics and how we like to approach solving them. The biggest issue that can happen with pneumatics is leaks. There are three ways to find a leak. The first one is listening. If the space is quiet, you might be able to hear the pssss sound of the leaking air. Usually this is due to an improper cut of the tubing or someone did not use plumber's tape on a metal to metal connection. Next, you could use the lick the back of your hand trick. If the space is noisy or the leak is just too quiet, you can use another sense to feel out the leak. The fast moving air from the leak will feel cool to the wet part of your hand. And then lastly, you can use soapy water. This is, however, not advised in the pits. Soapy water in a spray bottle can be used to test suspect connections. When the culprit is sprayed, bubbles will visually form, revealing where the leak can be found. If there is an issue with programming buttons to solenoids, know that the PCM will light up red for which slot is currently asked to be active. This can help you check that the right buttons activate the right solenoids without having to use the whole system. You can also manually fire the actuators by pressing on a little blue button at the top. This will allow you to test functionality of the machine without having to connect wirelessly. We hope you found this video somewhat informative and helpful in your team's implementation of pneumatics onto your robot. As always, be sure to put safety first by always dumping air before working on the pneumatic system. Thanks for watching and being with us here today. Remember to leave a comment with your team name and number so we know ro robots to cheer for this season. And as always, subscribe to this channel to keep finding out more on how this is how we robot.